Amen. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3 with me. If you don't have a Bible, there should be Bibles in the chairs in front of you. We just finished a series um, called Fake News, um, reclaiming the most misused, misunderstood verses in all of the Bible. Um, It was awesome. And so uh, if you wanted to check that out, you could find that on our YouTube page. Um, That said, we're going to be diving into a new sermon series starting next week. But today's is sort of a a one-off, something that that God has been speaking to me in my own kind of devotional life with Him. And so I wanted to share some of that with you. Um, So let's pray again really quick. Let's dedicate this time to the Lord and let's, let's get right into it. So Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that you are good. That your love is great. That your mercy endures forever. And I just pray now that as we spend this time in your presence, in your word, that you would meet with us. That any preconceived ideas of who we think you are or or what we think you should do would go right out the window, but that we would come to this place with a humble spirit, ready to learn all that you want to teach us this morning. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, there were, I love this story of these um, two shopkeepers, right? And they were, they were bitter, bitter rivals. They, they had shops literally right across the street from one another. And they didn't really like each other very much, to say the least. And so uh, anytime anything would go- good would happen for one of them, they would always make sure that they gave that kind of glance across the street. Make sure you see all these customers that are in my store and that, that, that's, that's my business and, um, and you've got nobody at your shop over there. Right? And so there was, this, there was this unhealthy competition that was there between these two shop owners. And then one day, one of the shop owners was visited by an angel. By the way, this is not a true story. So just in case you're like, oh, this is one of those churches. No, okay. Uh, so, uh, but, but this is a fake story, but just to, to you know, whatever. So, so this angel just shows up to this dude in the shop and he's just like, listen, I'm going to give you anything you ask for. However, whatever you ask for, I'm going to give your neighbor double. So the guy's like, that doesn't, doesn't sound, sound good to me. I don't, I don't like him. I don't want him to have double what I get. And, and so he began to think, should I ask for riches? And the angel quipped, I'll make you a very, very, very rich man. I'll just make him twice as rich. Should I, should I desire health? You can, and you'd be a very healthy man, but he'd live twice as long as you and be twice as healthy. And so he was a bit annoyed by all of this. And he sat there frustrated with a furrowed brow, trying to figure out what he could wish for. And ultimately looked up at the angel and said, I want you to strike me blind in just one eye so that he might be blind in two. Pride and selfishness are the two biggest hindrances to church unity today. And the crazy thing is, is that's a ridiculous little story, but so many of us in the church operate that way. We think about brothers and sisters that way. We think about other churches that way. Benjamin Franklin, he once said this. He said, it is the eyes of other people that ruin us. If all but myself were blind, I should not want neither fine house nor fine furniture. How often Do we want what we want and have what we have? Not because we really wanted it, but because we knew that if we threw it up on the Insta stories, everybody else would be like, oh, they got that. I really wanted that. I saw that too. Oh, is that an, is that, was that from an indie shop or was that from like H&M? Whatever that might look like. And and all of a sudden, and it's like, was it really that big deal that we got? No, it wasn't that big a deal that we got it. But, But what was the motivation for why we got it? And so often if we check our hearts, and check our motivations, we we begin to realize that so much of what we do is so that other people would see and other people would want what we have. And it's such a weird thing because when you read the Bible, the Bible is so countercultural. 
It goes and it flies in the face of all of these things. And so um, John chapter 3, where I had you turn, Jesus had just had this riveting conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus had, had met with Jesus and, and Jesus had, 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 had shared with him that you must be born again if you want to go to heaven. And there was this incredible conversation that they had, right? And, and, then, and then that conversation ends and Jesus leaves that conversation and he does what he always does. He begins to go about his father's business. Jesus goes about his father's business and he goes about ministering to people. He has his disciples baptizing people. And that's where we find ourselves today in the text in John chapter 3. A problem had arisen. A problem arose because there were two groups of people baptizing. You ever been to like a baptism on a beach and then there's like another church baptizing on the beach too? And you're just kind of like, dude, bro, I thought we reserved this time. I know you didn't tell you, but... but Two groups of people are baptizing, and they're like, I don't know if this is a good idea. And so, so it wouldn't have been a problem, but here, here's what happened. One of the groups began to get bigger than the other group, but the other group used to be bigger than that group, and all of a sudden, bitterness, jealousy, envy, these kind of things began to creep in. And so in John chapter 3, if you look with me at verse 22... It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside... And he remained there with them and was baptizing. The disciples of John were also baptizing. And John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem because water was plentiful there. Right? So there was no like, real spiritual reason for why he was doing it. There's just a lot of water there. Right? Sometimes we like to kind of... Um, no, there's just a lot of water. So that that's why they were baptizing there. And people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. And so you've got these two groups baptizing. And the problem arose because, because Jesus' group began to eclipse John the Baptist's group. But you have to understand that John was like the guy. John was the man. Everybody looked to John. People flocked to John. And then Jesus shows up and everybody begins to leave John and go to Jesus. And, 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 and what ends up happening is John didn't have a problem with it. But John's disciples had a problem with it. See, when everybody began to leave, John's disciples realized, oh, maybe I'm not really as important as I thought I was. And so they get angry and they begin to have this attitude that bubbles over. In verse 25, he says, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and the Jews over purification. Now, we don't know what this argument was about. Different commentators say different things, but it probably went something along the lines of um, who's, whose baptism is better? And all of a sudden, you're ask, answering questions like that. I know as a pastor, oftentimes you'll be speaking with people who are going from one church to another church and they want to talk about that church, and, and, but I love this church, but I don't like that church. And... and, and but we're all on the same team. And that's a theme that you're going to hear throughout this sermon is we're same team. Same team. Same goal. Same God. And so John's boys go to him and they say in verse 26, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, now he's baptizing and everybody's going to him. They were upset, again, because their star was diminishing. John was no longer the big show in town. And, and, and there was a temptation for John to be very upset, wasn't there? I mean, think about it. This dude was, he was a little bit weird, right? If you read the Gospels, he wore like camel clothes and ate crickets. and oh, was, He's a strange guy, right? So, oh, it's okay. We get strange people in the body of Christ. And look at how the Lord was using him. The Lord was using him to do great things. But this was a guy who was, who was alienated. This was a guy who, who found himself in the middle of nowhere. Nobody wanted to be his friend until all of a sudden he began to preach this gospel of repentance. People are coming to him by the droves. They're repenting of their sins. He's baptizing people. He was so much in the limelight that Herod, the king, took notice and took interest and began to ask questions. But this is such a massive issue in the church today. It's a huge issue. The Apostle Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 by calling sectarianism sin. 
Because that was what was happening even in the early church. There's nothing new under the sun. Even in the early church, they were like, well, you, well, I was baptized by Paul, and I was baptized by Apollos, and I was baptized by Peter, and everybody had their little camps. And Paul's like, this is nonsense. It's ridiculous. And we, we do that in the church today. And they were doing that right here in the text. And it would be very easy when I think on a personal level for me to get kind of bitter and envious and, and jealous if I were just to take my eyes off of Jesus and start putting my eyes on other people who perhaps operate in the same sphere I do. Like, like I, could, I could look out and be like, dang, man, Tim Keller and Ravi Zacharias are so much smarter than me. Like, did they just like, information comes in, they process it, what comes out, half the words they say, I don't even know them. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm like, what did he just say? Like, I, I, I love Tim Keller. I just don't read his books because I don't understand half of it. And I don't like reading the same paragraph like seven times. I just, I, I feel dumb. And, but, I'm, but here's the deal. I could be angry with this guy. He just thinks he's so smart. Or I can be like, praise God, Tim Keller's on my team. He's on my team. My team, representing Jesus, he's on my team. I've got no reason for bitterness or animosity because me and him serve the same God with the same goal to see people come to know Jesus. And so praise God for Tim Keller. And praise God for Ravi Zacharias. I don't understand more of what he says, right? It's just, pray, but praise God for those guys. I'm like, how did he go from there to, I don't, uh, whatever, but yeah, awesome, sounds good. Everybody looks confounded by this guy. But, but, but the same thing can happen as you're scrolling through Instagram. And, and if you're, Whatever, it, whatever your craft is, I can be scrolling and I can see different preachers who are so dynamic and the, and the things that they say are so clever. I'm like, did you make that up all by yourself? <laughs> or did you steal that from a commentary? Because I want to know what commentary you're reading, right? And they, got the, and they have these lines that they, and you say it and they're like, wow, you can make like a t-shirt out of that line. A bumper sticker, whatever, it was so clever. And again, I can look at that and be like, dude, these guys, are they really preaching the gospel? This is like gospel light. Because we get like that, right? And the church over there, it's just a concert, man. It's just a concert. We teach the Bible at Roots, man. Yeah, we teach the Bible. Praise God we teach the Bible. But there are so many churches, let me tell you something, there are so many churches throughout the world that I've attended. Man, listen, so many churches who teach God's Word, who have people that attend that church who know God's Word. I'm talking about Genesis to Revelation, verse by verse, we're going through it, and you know God's Word and do absolutely nothing with what you know. And you got people down the road who it's gospel light, but they're feeding the poor, and they're reaching the lost. And they have doors wide open to those who are struggling and trying to figure it all out. We're responsible for that which we know. And so we're called not just to be hearers of the word, but doers also. And praise God, we belong to a church that teaches God's word and we are doers. But I don't need to flip through Instagram and look at other people and begin to start kind of getting all judgy. And maybe you can relate to that, not even as a pastor, maybe you can relate to that as an individual who, I don't know what your field is, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a sales department or own a restaurant, I don't know what it is. But perhaps you then look out at other people and other groups and you begin to get sort of kind of judgy about that. Paul had those while he was in the Philippian jail, didn't he? Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, you had people who, Paul's in jail for the cause of Christ. He's in jail because he was preaching Jesus. And what ended up happening was all these people, while he was in prison, were like, the apostle Paul? Dude, that guy saying all kinds of stuff to slander his name. And, and Paul's followers were like, well, you know, kind of like, what should we do? And, and Paul's like, I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to do anything. And here's why I don't want you to do anything. Because it doesn't really matter what they say about me. Are they preaching the gospel? And if they're preaching the gospel, I don't care about what they say about me. Let them say whatever they're going to say. But if the gospel is going forth, praise God. And that is where we see the maturity in the life of John the Baptist. That's where we see a proper philosophy of ministry. He says in verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. See, John knew that nothing came his way apart from God. That he himself was nothing apart from God. Any abilities we have, any ministries we oversee, it's all a gift from God. 
It's, a, it's not because we're clever. It's not because we're cute. It's not because we were born with this innate ability to lead. No, it's because God has gifted us. Some of those things are natural abilities. Some of those things are supernatural abilities in that God has given us His Holy Spirit. And God has given us spiritual gifts. But they are gifts. They are gifts that He has given, not that we have mustered up in and of our own strength. And so too, if there's any area of our own lives that we excel, it is solely due to the fact that we serve a sovereign God who loves us and blesses us. And listen, and He uses us and He blesses us, not because of who we are, but because of who we aren't. Because in us there is great deficiency, but in Him there is none. And if we are going to do the work of God and we are going to see people served and loved and cared for, if we're going to see the gospel go forth and transform this city that we love, we better be a people that are dependent on God to do the work. And we better be empty vessels that are just like, God, use me. I don't know how you're going to use me because I'm not so-and-so, but, but I'm willing. I'm willing. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise, the weak to shame the strong. Moses couldn't speak. Jeremiah couldn't speak. He was a youth. Where were you when God found you? Where where were you when God opened your blind eyes and softened your hard heart? Where where were you? Because I think of my own life and I think of um, who I was and now who I am. and, and, And I recognize like the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, that I am who I am by the grace of God. I am who I am because of the grace of God. Because when I look at that kid who cried until the third grade, which was technically the fourth because I was held back in the first, because I didn't like people looking at me when I walked into a classroom, and then then to think to myself that now God is using me to teach the Bible, I just, because sometimes it's just weird. It's just so weird. I was so, I, I was such a shy kid. I hated people looking at me. I, I didn't want to ever do a presentation. And it, just, it, was, it wasn't just when I was a kid. I dropped out of regular college because every stinking major they told me about was like, oh, by the way, you're also going to have to do a presentation. I'm not doing a presentation. I'm out. I quit. <laughs> right? Even in Bible college. The only class I ever failed in Bible college was a class that they said, hey, pop quiz for your final. You're going to have to do a a presentation. I didn't show up. I didn't show up. I just failed the final, failed the class. I don't care. I'm not in it for the grades. I just want to know Jesus more. I don't need to be up in front talking to people. I don't want to do all that stuff, right? I didn't do that. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. Fail me. I don't care. This makes me feel really uncomfortable being up there, right? And so, and still did. You you know, after God called me, I used to throw up in the bathroom before I came up to a pulpit every single time. I still get as nervous as can be beforehand. My stomach hurts, all kinds of stuff. I gotta close the the plane right now because I gotta go to the bathroom. I don't don't feel good, right? But, But the reality is, is God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. He desires to gift you and use you in ways that you can't do it in and of yourself. It's got to be God. Because if it isn't God, you get the glory. And He's not into sharing His glory. And so He gifts you. And He uses you so that He might get the glory for everything that you do. And so verse 28, He says, You yourselves bear witness, John the Baptist says, that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before Him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. This joy of mine is now complete. You know when John the Baptist first met Jesus? He was in the womb. The Bible says that Mary walked in pregnant with Jesus... And it says that John the Baptist leapt with joy in the room at the presence of Jesus. That could get us into a whole social issue that I'm going to just lay off right now because we can get at that in a later day. In the womb, he was leaping for joy in the presence of Jesus. And how beautiful it is here at the height of John the Baptist's ministry, he still finds joy in the voice of the Lord. John uses this analogy that Jews would be, um, they would understand it very well, this idea of the, the bridegroom and, 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 and the groom. And, and, 
And people understood in this culture that if you were the best man, it wasn't about you. I mean, we, I think we kind of understand that too, right? You ever been asked to be a groomsman or a best man? It's, it's for sure not about you, right? Okay? Uh, just in case you didn't know that, Justin and Kayla are getting married. If you're in their wedding party, it's not about you, okay? Um, what, what would end up happening is, is um, the, the, the bride's groom or whatever they call him, best, what is called the best man? I'm not going to use all this. The best man took care of all of the details. He, he invited the guest. Wouldn't that be nice? Nobody would get mad at you. They just let him invite him. Yeah. He invited all of the guests. He organized the whole thing. He, he escorted the bride and the groom to the bridal chamber. He made sure everything ran smoothly. And at the end of the ceremony, the groom would come out and he would just, he would just bless him. He would encourage him. And he would sing this dude's praises. And what ended up happening, what would happen is that the best man's heart was just so full of joy at that. And this is the point that John the Baptist is trying to get out. He's saying, listen, I'm just a forerunner. I get to be the person who points people to Jesus so that they leave me and go to him. And in this, I am well pleased. And in the same way for you and I, we need to find our joy in hearing from the voice of the Lord. We need to be a people who find our joy in hearing from the voice of the Lord. Because listen to me, this is very practical and you need to understand this. Your joy is not going to come from a husband. Your joy is not going to come from a wife. And if you're married, your joy is not going to come from a different husband or a different wife. Your joy is not going to come from a new car. Your joy is not going to come from a new house. You may have moments of woohoo, but all that dies. That, that elation you feel, it begins to subside. It's not going to come from a position in ministry, that promotion you've always desired. None of those things are bad. All of those things are good. But if you are not finding your joy from the voice and the presence of God, you will always be lacking. You, you'll always be walking through seasons of kind of desert. Those, you know how you feel that way sometimes? Where it's, like, it's just like dry seasons. I'm convinced that so often we, we walk through those dry seasons because we're not really spending time in the presence of Jesus. Our joy comes from hearing the voice of the Lord, being in God's Word, allowing God's Word to get in us, cultivating a prayer life, being at the feet of Jesus, being connected to a community that, that sharpens one another and encourages one another and points each other to Jesus. Because this is the ultimate picture of humility here in the text. John's followers are leaving him. Spotlight is turning off. Uh, in just a short period of time, John is literally going to get his head cut off. And this, this was what completed his joy. He finishes in verse 30 that he must increase but I must decrease. That he must increase, but I must decrease. There are three musts in John chapter 3. Three musts. The first one is in John chapter 3, verse 7, where Jesus says, Do not marvel that I say this to you. You must be born again. The necessity of rebirth. Verse 14, he says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The fact that the only way we receive that new birth is through the sacrificial uh, love of Jesus. That he died on a cross for our sins, rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death. It is only through his sacrifice that we can enter into that new, new birth. We, we must enter in that way. It's not optional. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. Nobody's going to heaven except through Jesus. Don't quote me, quote Jesus. He said that. Okay? And, and, and the third one in verse 30 here, that he must increase... And I must decrease. He must increase. It's as Christians, it's when we find ourselves taking a back seat to all that the Lord is doing that we then begin to experience the fullness of joy as we walk with Him. He must increase. We must decrease. When Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, the pioneering missionary to the country of China, 
That dude single-handedly did so much incredible work for the kingdom of God in China. And, and, and he was being presented with an award at this ceremony in Australia. And so you know how it is when, when you've spent your life for Jesus and there's all these accolades and accomplishments. Uh, you know, they, they kind of shower him with praises. And, and, and so they call him up before um, th this meeting, this gathering. And, and Hudson Taylor begins his a speech by saying, Dear friends, I am the uh, little servant of an illustrious master. I am the little servant of an illustrious master. He must increase, I must decrease. Because check it out, who cares if you're a good speaker if Jesus Christ is not your focal point? Who cares how well you can play an instrument if it's not Jesus you're bringing glory to? Who cares how many ministries you're involved in if all you care about is people thinking more of you and not Him? Who cares how great you are at whatever it is you're great at if Jesus Christ is not being magnified? Not only was John not bothered because he knew his role and who Christ was, but because he also understood we're all on the same team. A win for you is a win for me. And so he closes, verse 31, he says, he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is, is of above. He who bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. God has come in human form and he is greater than I. And he's greater than I. There are those who are going to reject the words of God. And there are those who are going to accept the words of God. And for those of us who have accepted the word of God, we are privied to the truth of God's word. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the spirit without measure, verse 34. The spirit of God, the Bible says, is, is poured out with, without measure. Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of God was poured out on Jesus, descended on Jesus. Verse 35 says, The Father's love, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Jesus Christ is loved by the Father. Everything that Jesus did pleased the Father, which is why He's the perfect example as we're paging through the Gospels to Watch and pattern our lives after the life of Jesus because everything Jesus did pleased the Father. Jesus Christ literally is the center of God's heart, God's will, God's purpose. So whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, verse 36. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So why does the wrath of God remain on those who do not believe because, listen, because those who choose to reject the incredible finished work of Christ on the cross, if you choose to reject His sacrifice, His substitute for you, what you're doing in essence is you're trampling the blood of Christ. You're trampling the blood of Christ. You are drowning in the quicksand we call sin and, and refusing to reach out to his nail-pierced hands. You are rejecting the finished work of Christ. And so because you are rejecting the finished work of Christ, he, in so many respects, gives you exactly what you've always wanted and desired. Because there is only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, Acts chapter 4. And that is the name of Jesus. There's no two ways. There's no three ways. There's no just be a good person. That's nonsense. That's worldly. That's not Bible. The Bible is crystal clear about how we get to heaven and the means by which we enter in. He may increase. We may decrease. And that's my prayer this morning for you, for me. May He increase in preeminence and prominence in our lives. May we find ourselves decreasing.
May we remember that, that Christianity is not a competition, that we live for the same God and we play for the same team, and it's all for one goal, and that's to see Jesus glorified, Jesus' name lifted high, Jesus adored among the nations. That's our heart. That should always be our heart, and that should always be our goal. That's why as a church, we don't just have Sunday service, and that's just like a wrap, and we just say, good night, see you next Sunday. But it's why we put such a high value on community groups so that nobody's doing life alone, so that nobody just feels like they're coming to a little country club on a Sunday and then you take off and then you never kind of see anybody until the next Sunday. No, we provide spaces so that you can get plugged in and so that you don't have to walk through life alone. You should never feel like you have to walk through life alone. You are a part of a family and you were never created and designed to live on an island. It is not spiritual to say, I love Jesus, I just hate church. No, that's not spiritual. That's actually anti-Bible. We're to love church because we love the church because Jesus loves the church. And so we are a people who gather together, not just on a Sunday, but we, we gather for community groups. We gather to serve, to bless, to love our community through, through outreaches where we are um, having block parties and sharing the gospel with uh, tons of different people, where we're setting up a stands next to subway stations to give out hot chocolates and coffee in the winter for commuters, just so that we can give them an invite card and just so that we can share the love of Jesus with them. We're a people who gather together and we do prayer walks because we believe that God is the only one who can break down the strongholds in this city. And so we depend on Him to do so. We're a church that meets right after service and say, hey, that was great that we got to get together and, and kind of hear God's word. But the reality is, is, is this part of the service, it, it, this is the equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry starts in like an hour and 10 minutes where we're going to be out there and we're going to be painting faces and painting nails and doing balloon animals and, and engaging parents and giving out backpacks and school supplies. And we got... We got brothers who are coming through here that are going to cut, give free back to school haircuts for these kids in this community. All so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. All so that we're not just people who talk about how we love Jesus, but we're people who actively act it out. We live it out. We are not just hearers, but we are doers also. And so as we transition next week into a new series on kingdom culture, we have a, a special guest speaker that's coming out um, named Justin Thomas. And I, and I, I never really kind of do this at the end of a service. This is usually something that happens in an announcement. But I want to I wanna throw this out there because, you know, we have, we have the, 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 the young adults, the college ministry from Eden who's going to be kind of coming back. And so we, we have a number of people who are going to be coming back through here. And, and I need you to know that next week as we, as we dive into this new series on on um, a, a kingdom culture, we're going to be talking about some subjects that, to be perfectly honest with you, the world, the world wouldn't be happy. And there are other churches, no doubt, that wouldn't even talk about these things. But Justin Thomas is a pastor who lives in Capitol Hill, Seattle, which is the largest concentration of people who struggle with same-sex attraction or homosexuality, or whatever that might look like in that context. And he has a thriving church right in the center of all of that. And so we're going to have a time where, where we come together and he's going to share with us uh, from God's word what it means, what, what biblical sexual ethics mean. And we're going to stand firm on God's word and we're not going to waver on God's word. We're not going to be people who are, are blown by every wind of doctrine. We're not, going to, we're not going to embrace what society tells us we should believe or what our professors tell us we should believe or what a president or a king or anybody else for that matter says we should believe. We're going to stand on the word of God. We always will. And none of that is ever going to change. And so we're going to graciously and lovingly walk through what, what, what identity and sexuality and these kind of things look like in our context here in 2019. And so Justin's going to be bringing that word. And after that message, we're going to have a, a, a discussion here, a question and answer where people are able to turn in questions. So if you have questions, you can fire those off into the offering boxes after service. Um, also, on top of that, uh, we'll have different kind of little Instagram posts and whatnot where if you want to ask questions through there, you can. We'll save those questions and ask them next Sunday after church. But, but all throughout the very next week, we have one of our um, a board members of the church who is a, a fashion model in New York City. And he's going to talk very practically about how we can engage culture. And then I'm going to, on the third and final message, I'm going to wrap up this series um, 
by talking directly to the individual and helping you to understand that we exist in 2019 for such a time as this. To take everything that we're learning and apply it to our lives so that we can be most effective for King Jesus. And that day we are, we are relaunching our, our, our brand. We have a brand new logo. We're gonna, we have t-shirts, new signs, new flat. We have a big old barbecue. We're going to have a, ba mark your calendars, uh, September 15th. We're going to have a baptism right out here. Eating hot dogs, singing to Jesus, and dunking folk. Okay? And that's what that Sunday is going to look like. So, so I'm super encouraged by all that the Lord is doing. Um, you know, I, I say this often to those uh, closest to me, but sometimes I just kind of sit here and I, and, and I just think to myself, man, I just remember coming here by myself, just in a car by myself with, with nobody. I couldn't even bring my wife. I didn't even have enough money. I lived on a couch. And to see what the Lord has done in such a short period of time in New York City, now, praise God. Greater things are yet to be done, and, and I believe that. And so I can't wait for these next kind of few weeks and all that the Lord is going to do. So let's pray. Let's commit this time to the Lord, and let's get busy. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that you...